was a fire with 120 potential victims and zero mercy. Now I'm outside, our building is on fire. Outside, people scrambled in search of loved ones. He said, where are the patients located? That's what you want to know. The fire had already burned for 45 minutes. There was someone up there. There was someone in the windows over here. And they could still see the eerie silhouettes of elderly patients trapped on the very top floor. There's someone Somebody, up there and the and second to last one on the fourth floor, they were just looking out the window. It's like the fire department can't get can't up there to get those people, it. but they've got everybody else. There they stood, opening the window for any hint of fresh air, waiting and hoping for firefighters to make their way up, then slowly carry them down. And you, you have to do it systematically because we don't want to, to miss anyone. One by one, step by step, each patient guided to the ground some in stretchers gently passed from firefighter to firefighter. I don't have any names. Anybody's been transported. All the while, friends and relatives gather in one location. No, I haven't heard anything yet. We're just waiting. Two hours into the fire, many still don't know if their loved one is safe, injured, or worse. No, I'm just receiving some of their information to double check. The fire department collects names trying to account for every patient and comfort every family. Well, do we need to go to the hospitals to find out if our family's there? My mom's on the second floor. Going to a hospital right now, to me, uh, you, you would be better off to stay here for right now. There is no easy way to cope with so much uncertainty, especially when the news only gets worse. Five confirmed fatalities. A terrifying number that would only grow larger with time. The sad conclusion to a merciless fire that unfairly attacked a helpless home. The usually calm Big 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 Creek is now a raging river, dangerous, swamping nearby roads. 9911, where's your emergency? There's a truck out in the water, and the water's coming all the way across. The we tried to get him not to go out in it. The emergency call came in just after 8 a.m. Eddie Bishop had tried crossing flooded Mount Joy Road. His pickup was swept away, pinned against a tree by the current. Getting ready to go in. Emergency crews waited, hoping for the water to recede. But with more rain in the forecast, they decided it was too risky to wait. David Crane, the team leader, agreed to wear a microphone. And here's his exclusive take during what happened next. Help us to do the job that we've been trained to do, Lord. Just watch over us. Help us to bring this gentleman out. What we're doing is something that we could die at any minute. Feed us some rope. Feed us some rope. We're starting to pick up a little swift. Stay in the truck. Hold on. He don't want us to come get him. Oh, no. Stay in the truck. Stay in the truck. I'm going right to the front of the truck and talk to him from the front of the truck. Roll your window back down. What the problem is, sir, is we got another storm coming in. This water's going to start going back up here in just a minute. So that's why we want to get you out of here. What we're going to do is I'm going to put this life jacket on, okay? Put your pants back on. All right, you're hooked in with us. Let me close the door. Yep. All right. Bishop yeah. was slowly escorted to safety. His rescuers say the current was swift but workable. Put 50 pounds of uh, something on your legs, 50 pound weights and try to walk up steps. And that's kind of how the water feels against your, resisting your legs. Just easy step. Bishop was checked for hypothermia and then sent home. Murray County Sheriff Enoch George says he's lucky he wasn't killed. George says Bishop used poor judgment, but he won't be written a citation. No, no ticket for, uh, for stupidity. 3.30 sharp. Typically the end of a work day at Barrett Firearms, but on this day... My daughter's rearranged it a lot. No one's making any guns. Dance the cheek, dip, cheek. They're just making room for a party. <laughs> you see, Ronnie Barrett has a lot to celebrate. 20 years ago, he made a prototype for a 50 caliber rifle. I was 26 years old. I didn't have any education in engineering or anything like that. It was just a labor of love. This is his baby today. A long-range sniper rifle. Get your hearing protection on. Able to hit a target with precision, even if it means going through brick or concrete. Instead of sending a rocket up into his window, you can work on it, you know, with a with a rifle like this and, and come out a lot safer. Now his baby is getting a big job. It's a rather large contract. This initial contract will uh, will be around $21 million. $21 million to manufacture the long-range sniper rifle for the U.S. Army. A good reason to throw a party. This is going to, like, throw me back. The safety's off or on right now? 
It's going to be like a concussion wave just coming over your head. And at this party, guests could test drive the rifle. I'm not going to move it to aim it. Okay. More, That's I guess. Fine. Is that okay? <laughs> Before this, Stephanie Pascali's experience was limited to BB guns. <laughs> okay, I think I'm done. <laughs> now she knows why fighters train so hard. A lot more respect for them now. That's for sure. <laughs> cool. A lot of respect for a big gun, but now as a big contract. Now we're so very honored to be able to be here and to provide a good service to our country. It's been in there a long time. That's a picture of Pat and Frank when Frank was a junior and Pat was a senior. They have been competitive all their life. They wrestled when they were about three and four years old. And people used to say, well, what do you do about them? I said, well, when the chandelier starts shaking, I go up and try to stop. <laughs> they were always wrestling. Go! Well, here we are. About 35 years later, and we're still wrestling. <laughs> Frank is at MBA. In, out, pull. There it is. And Patrick's at Ryan. Pull it, boom, right to your double. Take them all the way down. Uh, us two kind of fight it out uh, over usually who's the two best teams in the city. One, two. That's, that's our biggest rival. Other guy. Because it's family versus family. Are you buying three tickets or four tickets? Uh, last year at Father Ryan, it was almost standing room only. <laughs> Just here cheering and the gym shaking. <laughs> Just to look around, the whole gym is packed. Come on, man. You gotta get some now. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Whoever wins gets to talk pretty big at, at, uh, at, the, at the dinner tables at Easter, Christmas, and, and Thanksgiving. So Hit it! It, it's a year long, year long bragging right. Keep him down! Go for the pit! Where you? Where you? over uh, generally whoever loses is, is pretty upset you know you just kind of pat each other on the back and we kind of go to our own corners for a couple of days and cool off and then uh, by, by after a day or two I guess we come back and hug each other and, and we go on it's it's life is normal shoulder pads helmet cleats everything you need harp with high is like any school physical contact where jocks play football Marching band is really fun. Musicians join the band. Music's my life. And any thought of role reversal? I don't know how to read music. Seems like an incomplete pass. No, I wouldn't really want to play football. To the brass section. Unless, that is, you're Daniel Davidson. 88. 88. 88. Yeah, Daniel Davidson. A little nervous, kind of excited. You see, this is the biggest Friday of the fall. It'll be our last game if we don't win. Seniors. Juniors are on the tour bus. Harpeth High is heading west to Carroll County for round one of the playoffs. And a boy, that's a good snap right there. And number 88, Daniel Davidson, Kicker. has a lot on his mind. If it comes down to it and I, I mess up, then everybody hates you. And if you do good, then everybody loves you. Well, the stats spell underdog. They're playing the greatest game there is, guys. They can't measure team spirit. The football team is pumped. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. The band is charged. But all too quickly, their fate is clear. Right, let's go, Daniel! Let's go! The team can muster only one first down in the first quarter. And young Daniel isn't kicking so much as punting. Well, tonight's not the best night. The kind of night where halftime provides a much needed rest. All right. Don't worry about it. Unless that is you're Daniel Davidson. Daniel's sort of an interesting kid. And he, he plays the trumpet and the kicker. Yep, this jock is also a musician. This might be the last run of our show. Let's make it the best. Even on game nights. Talk to Thank you. Even at halftime. First time you do it, it feels a little weird, but and then it grows on you. With a trumpet in his hands and pads on his shoulders, he sticks way out. Daniel's proud mom may be the only band parent who can spot her kid with ease. Most everyone can spot him. The football player. The football player. The football player. Even the fans in the opposing stands were taken aback. If it was our team, he'd be made fun of. You know, being from Huntington, band and football are two separate things, and you don't mix them. 
But to Daniel's classmates, they mix just fine. It's, it's cool to see like a football player, player in the uniform the in the band. <laughs> Even Daniel's grandpa thinks it's cool. It's like deja vu, as they say all over again. About 40 years ago, he also played the trumpet and also played football. It was not unusual at that time for us to come out at halftime in our uniforms and perform. I haven't seen that happen since then. So maybe it's genetic, or maybe it's that Daniel is gripping the exact same trumpet his grandpa once played. It kind of gives you goosebumps every now and then when you see that. <laughs> Whatever it is, Daniel now knows this solo will be one of his final performances on the field. In the second half, his team never catches up. And both the football season and marching band season end at once. I'd say band hit a little better tonight. Two worlds that seem so far apart. Unless, that is, you're Daniel Davidson. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, we're really proud of you. Joe Fry. Awesome. We love Daniel. News Channel 5. We're going to go home tonight bad. <laughs> yeah. But we still love Daniel. The building is unique, yeah. I think the building's about 100 years old. With the brick walls that they've retained here, um, just the quaintness of, of the whole building itself. And the elevator is, is part of it. Because people get off the elevator and always comment how quaint it is. Something kind of weird about it. Now it's going back up. I don't know where it's going. And it tends to kind of go up and down by itself. It'll just kind of roam around. Where to now? We're on four, Gerard. Oh, we were on three. No. Sometimes it appears to have a mind of its own. It just went to four, and I didn't even hear it take off, did you? It's kind of the focal point of our reception area, and it'll be funny to look them, look, watch them look over and see that nobody's getting off. Now it's back to two. And there's nobody there. <laughs> and that kind of opens me up to tell them the story about the ghost. On it, it could be. It's got the little seat, and we're just not quite sure who rides it. There you go. We can watch the old dial spin, and we know that somebody's going to be getting off the elevator. You get on, you'll hit whatever floor you want to go to, and then it'll just go straight to the basement. No, not stopping, it'll go a lot faster than it normally does. We'll call the elevator people, and it won't do it again. The basement's kind of creepy. Yes, very creepy. Have you been down there yet? When it dropped Faye in the basement and left her down there for a couple of hours. I might take the fire escapes out. <laughs> it's just one of the characteristics of this, this cool building. 